So good afternoon. So uh, my name is uh, Jun Chiu Liu. So I'm a what? Yeah, okay. What? So I'm a, I'm a PhD student uh, with Professor Tobias Kimmonberg at the PFL. So um, so I'm going to give you a, a tutorial on uh, Lumrico FDTD for integrated photonics. And uh, first of all, I have to thank my my colleagues uh, Tian Yi and uh, and Jing. Who also help a lot to 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 make this uh, tutorial and uh, and the slides and also the later the template that you're going to use in this class. Okay. So I guess you guys has a has a wonderful time uh, in the morning with uh, with Comso. Uh, you know Comso is uh, based on finite element method, and actually it's uh, it work on the frequency domain. So basically you have to give a certain frequency, and actually uh, calculate the boundary condition and then give the electric field. Distribution over the entire simulation zone, and Lumrico doing the same way. So the FDD is, is doing the same way, but they solve the problem in the time domain. And this is the very nature because you can imagine that the, the entire simulation is is done in the way that you are watching a movie. So you basically see how the light pulse or dynamics of the system, how these things are evolve with with time. So so Lumrico is actually a tool. That actually uh, uh, for for design of photonic components, a circuit and the systems, so it's basically uh, used the fin uh, finite difference time domain. Uh, so it's working the time domain, and actually the a logarithm is called the years method, which is a numerical analysis technique for modeling computational electrodynamics. Okay, since it's a time domain method, uh, so Lumrico can cover a wide frequency range with a single simulation run. So if you want to know actually the broad Frequency response of your system, you don't have to do to input your frequency. Yeah, to, to actually have a multiple uh, uh, simulation runs with, with different input frequency, you can just put all the things together, and he actually analyze these uh, frequencies uh, in a parallel way. Okay, so therefore this uh, this kind of uh, uh, processing is is very natural so you can treat uh, a nonlinear material property in the most uh, natural way this is actually what uh, what is very difficult to uh, implement with finite element method like comso in comso you have to uh, use uh, multi physics you have to bring a lot of things together which is not the uh, which is not uh, easy to do yeah the ftdd method belongs to in the general class of gray based differential numerical modeling method which is uh, also a, a class of uh, finite different method okay the time-dependent Maxwell equations in partial differential form are discretized using central difference approximation to the space and the time partial derivatives. So basically, you solve the, the equation, the problem, first in the, in the space domain, okay, spatial domain, and then the time moves one step further, and then basically this iteration happens, then you solve the, the, the things like uh, as the time in, uh, evolution. So the result finite difference equation are solved in either software or hardware in a leapfrog manner. Yeah? The electric field vector components in a volume of space are solved at the given instant in time, and then the magnetic field vectors components in the same spatial volume are solved at the next instant in time. And the process is repeated over and over again until the desired transient or steady state axiomatic field behavior is fully evolved. Okay. So in, in a general process flow of this year algor uh, algorithm, that first you have to give a kind of, uh, you set everything zero as the initial condition, and then you start to solve the D field and the E field, basically the electric field uh, distribution. And then you handle this E field boundary condition, handle the uh, E field source, and you get update the B field with the you update the B field, the, the magnetic, magnetic field, with the E field you solve. And then you use updated the B field to update your E field, and then do it uh, uh, with multiple iteration until that actually your system actually reach uh, equilibrium. That usually you have a criterion, uh, you have a, a standard, you have a criteria that tells you, okay, now your system is actually in the equilibrium. Or actually you can actually uh, simulate the transient behavior of uh, of your system. Just give a finite uh, uh, simulation time. Yeah. So if you want to know actually more about uh, uh, Lumerical FDD, the theory, and uh, the method, the math behind, uh, you are recommended to read this paper, which is uh, written by Alan Tuflov, 
and uh, now I think it's a volume three or, or four, uh, which is a very, uh, very beautiful uh, book that actually covers a lot of uh, aspect of uh, uh, FTDD methods and also tells you how to model things for different scale, for different purpose, different device. And I think Lumrico is actually um, the CEO, uh, is that <coughs> the founder of Lumrico is actually stern, uh, stern from, from uh, Alan Tuffloff's group, actually. Yeah. So this is a general kind of uh, um, how you have to, uh, um, to think about how to, have to design your simulation. And so first, you have to create a structure yeah, so you need to understand what you're going to. You're, it's a Tina or it's an integrated waveguide or whatever structure you can you can construct. Okay, and then you have to set the simulation parameter. For example, the material parameter, the light source you are working with, and uh, and then you have to also the boundary condition, whether you place the entire structure in a kind of uh, uh, isolated structure or actually you have radiation from the boundary. So you have to consider this. So this is the simulation parameters. Now you have to define the source. So what kind of source I'm going to work with? Is it a microwave or is it optical frequencies? If it is optical frequencies, it's a, it's a, re, it's a, it's a visible light, it's a mid infrared, it's a near infrared, or I actually I want to con consider all of them. I want to know actually the, the response of the system at the mid uh, visible and in near infrared at the same time. So basically, you have to define uh, your source, and you have a lot of freedom to actually put all the consideration together and then to run the simulation in, in one shot. And then you have to define the monitor, because you need to know where you want to see. For example, if you look at the antenna, you want to know actually how this antenna is propagates. So you have to place your, your monitors probably several places in your entire simulation zone. Uh, in the integrated waveguide, you usually look at the optical mode in the target waveguide. So you don't have to look at a lot of them, yeah? but you have to probably, you can, you can, in principle you can, yeah? but you can actually selectively look at the, the mode propagation or actually uh, the mode analysis or the coupling ratio and with, uh, with, uh, at a selected at a, a target uh, uh, place. And this is actually the monitor. So basically, monitor gives you the data that you want to look at. And of course, you have to check your simulation. And you need to make sure that actually your simulation makes some sense, and things are organized in the right way, and, uh, and uh, there's no kind of uh, unphysical uh, uh, parameter you set with the simulation. And of course, then you run the simulation, and finally you analyze the result. And actually, this can take iterations, because what you learn from COMSO, for example, is that uh, the numerical position yeah, depends on the mesh size you have. So you can make a very fine mesh, but this uh, becomes a very consuming. It takes a lot of memory, it takes a lot of disk. And so you don't want to start your simulation with a, with a very, very fine structure, because you don't want to wait for one or two days and get the useless data. Because in simulation, in computational, people say the trash in, trash out. So you don't want to put the trash in and wait a lot of time, and then get the nonsensical uh, uh, data. So usually, you, you start the simulation uh, you, especially with Lumerico because it's 10 domains, so it's, uh, it's going to be much more time consuming than, than uh, finite element method. So you probably start with, uh, with a very rough mesh, and this is basically to check if your simulation makes some sense. Sometimes people just make a very stupid uh, uh, mistake. For example, the source should be, uh, the light should be propagating the forward way, but you accidentally put it into the backward way. And basically, you usually start with a very low mesh, and just to, just to benchmark, just to make sure that your, your system makes some sense. It's a physical system. And then you start to increase the mesh. So you make your structure finer and finer, and then you look at your numerical, uh, uh, numerical uh, uh, convergence. This is like a console that you learn in the morning, that actually uh, the threshold, is actually, uh, the, the value becomes convergent, and you know actually finally there's a steady state. And then you know, actually, with this kind of mesh order, with this kind of level of mesh, I can get a, a reasonably a, a precise value. And simultaneously, I don't have to spend a lot of time uh, awaiting these, uh, these things. OK, so basically, it's, uh, it's, uh, all, this, is the, this is the same idea for all the finite different methods. 
that uh, that uh, for for FDD method or for FEM for everything. So, so what are we going to do today? Is actually uh, to simulate uh, uh, one thing which is very common is actually the bus waveguide to a uh, uh, ring resonator coupling, and so. Maybe some of you are, uh, work with uh, silicon photonics, uh, and you know that actually usually silicon photonics they, they work with waveguide, and in waveguide there's a lot of uh, optical modes. So usually it's not a single mode; it's multi mode. This is also the case for, for fiber. Just fiber has more mode, and uh, and the waveguide integrated waveguide has less mode. But uh, for for all these modes, actually they are quite distinct. So basically you can treat different uh, spatial modes. Yeah. Uh, as different channels. And uh, for integrated photonics, you really look at the channel to channel transmission or coupling. So you want to actually have a separate analysis of different modes. And you want to only target with, uh, with a selected mode. This is, uh, this is a very important uh, also for our case that you know our group is working with integrated photonics with a micro comb of uh, uh, micro resonant frequency comb generation. And, uh, and actually, and sometimes you want to engineer your mode. You want to have a mode which has an engineered dispersion such that you can actually generate a comb on that particular mode. So not all the optical mode can give you frequency comb. And this makes, uh, this put a very stringent requirement on our to design a, a photonic circuit, yeah, the waveguide with a certain width, height, bending radius, such that the mode has a certain refracting index and geometry dispersion. And then we can actually uh, generate the solitone microcomb or also engineer the, uh, uh, the comb spectrum envelope. And so this is important. And also you can actually know what is the uh, coupling rate between two modes. And this tells you if you work with uh, a micro resonator, you know that actually you want to operate your micro resonator at a critical coupling point, which means that all the power you input into your system is, 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 is transmitted uh, into the micro resonator and uh, dissipated by system. So if you make a filters, yeah. So you, of course you want to have a, 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 a maximum distinction. So uh, so you want to have a zero transmission. So you have to uh, know. For example, if you know the intrinsic loss of your micro resonator, okay, then you can design this uh, this structure by putting by uh, designing your bus waveguide to match the ring resonator such that the uh, external coupling is equal to the intrinsic loss. Then you work in the precisely uh, critical coupling point. And this allows you to actually build the high extinction filters and, and things like this. OK. And just for, for this case, i be more specific that actually, usually we want to work with a fundamental mode. T usually, and usually it's a, it's a transverse electric field mode. So TE mode means actually the polarization is, uh, is in the plane. So which means the polarization is actually uh, in the plane. So actually, if you look at the cross section, it's actually in this direction. Yeah? And, uh, and the TM mode, the other polarization is actually polarized in the other mode. So most of the time, that uh, people only work with this direction because that's usually, uh, most of the time, that this is what the integrated laser gives, the polarization that is given by the integrated lasers. And uh, so you can actually launch, you imagine that you launch your fundamental mode in the bus waveguide, yeah, from the laser or for whatever, and then this couples into your waveguide. Now your waveguide, it doesn't contain, is, is, is a multi-mode, so basically it's, uh, it, can, it can support fundamental mode, but simultaneously it can also support the higher order mode, <coughs> right? And then after one round trip, it couples back into the, the bus waveguide, and then you have to think about, I must still get the single mode, the fundamental mode, or I start to actually mix up this mode. So I start to get the fundamental mode plus higher order mode here. And this is a question you have to ask, because if something couples to a higher, a higher order mode, the other channel works as a loss channel. So basically you didn't get a dissipation, but you get the mode into the other channel that can give you potential interference, which actually confuse your detector, or actually you have a kind of filtering section, and then this actually filter out the, the other channel, which makes uh, this uh, other channel into a lost channel. So this is something that you have to op uh, optimize. This is, uh, uh, this is very vital, very important uh, for, for our, what uh, our research on uh, nonlinear photonic, uh, nonlinear optics, because every loss matters. So we want to have reduced the loss 
to the maximum degree, so we can actually have the uh, highest Q microresonator. Then we have the uh, maximum intracavity buildup. This allows to actually enhance the nonlinear effect. So now we actually can sh uh, can help you to actually um, do this. Uh, so um, so we're going to go into the <coughs> uh, the lumic of this model. So if you go to the drop the, the driver right G uh, Google Drive that actually I have a put a template there. Uh, so you can download it, which I think is a Lumric or coupler straight. <coughs> <coughs> so you don't have to model anything. So basically everything is modeled for you already. So you can, you can first start to actually uh, play with, with this software, uh, because this is a template. The good thing of Lumric is that this is a uh, I have to say that uh, this software uh, panel, this structure is not, uh, it's not, uh, looks very cheap actually. It's not, uh, not like console with fancy colors. It looks very cheap like, uh, like, uh, like uh, yeah. But the thing that they actually, they actually uh, organize, they have very good uh, uh, algorithm. So the Lumerico, the, the FDD the algorithm, they did a good job. But usually you cannot find out because they're not going to tell you. So you're trying to hack this uh, software, usually just crash the software. And the other thing that uh, if you download the Lumric, you find that actually they provide you a lot of example. So if you have no knowledge about uh, uh, simulation of uh, uh, microstructures, then you, you probably have to first check what is the example that Lumric will provide you, and then you can start. And also Lumric has a very good community, has a very good knowledge database that allows to uh, share the opinion and share the experience between multiple users. So you can ask your questions to other users. They may help you. So this is a very good. Uh, so Lumrico actually did a very, very good job on the ecological system. Yes. Sorry, I just had to find in the file. Uh, yeah. Google Drive, yes. Active site, yes. folder. Can you show it? Yes. Yeah, I didn't put that in the separate folder yet. No. Exos is it? Yeah, it's the main in the main folder. Yes. Okay, everything is clear. Everyone's on the same page. It's large. I hope I didn't uh, put the uh, put the one with uh, all or simulated result already. Okay. <coughs> now I, I show you that the um, <coughs> how this uh, was uh, was uh, so you okay. So basically, you have to look. Uh, so first, uh, several key part of your of your simulation. So here is just basically a view from different angle of your simulated structure. Okay, you have this. Uh, and the funny thing is that this is not in scale. So basically, if you look at the XZ view, this is actually in scale. So basically, you know actually how the size looks like. But the, actually, the XZ view and the YZ view, they are not in scale. So it looks like uh, the X axis, uh, the Y axis, once, uh, one micrometer in the Y axis, uh, in the Z axis, is different from one micrometer in the, in the, in the uh, Y axis. So this is, uh, can be very misleading. Yeah? 
And uh, this, but this is just for you to zoom in the structure and to actually get a better, better view of, of your structure. So if you look at the here, the basically this tells you different functionalities. For example, you can choose your material. You can choose the structure. You can actually build different components. And then uh, this is, of course, your simulation volume. And then this is actually a monitor that you can put. And then I see it's a monitor. And this is also, so basically this is a, this on top, this is the main, uh, 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 main functionality of, uh, of the software. And of course, you have the resource. So basically, you can configure your simulation with, uh, with multiple core. So if you can run this simulation in a, in a HPC, so high performance uh, uh, computing, then you can actually configure. So actually, all the kind of computer cores and, uh, can actually accelerate the, the computation. And, uh, and uh, here is actually basically tells you the, the uh, components that you already use or built into your, into your model. So for example, you have uh, this uh, geometry. So the geometry defines the waveguide or the substrates or basically just the shape of your microstructure you want to simulate. And then you have the second one, which is called the FDTD. And this is actually the simulation zone. Basically, everything inside, this is the FTTD simulation zone. Okay? So everything inside this zone is simulated. Everything outside this zone, basically, it doesn't exist. So basically, there's no difference that if I put a top cladding here or not. Or here you see actually the part of the waveguide out of the outside the simulation zone. So basically there, there are nothing as, as this is the same as you, you put nothing there. Okay. And then you have the source, which is this one. And then the arrow tells that the, on which direction you, you 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 launch your source. So of course you want to see how the coupling, so of course the source, the light, is propagates toward the the, the, the center of the simulation. And then you have the monitors, so you can actually place the monitor in this plane. You actually can tell us how the, the coupling situation inside this plane. Or you can put the monitor in the normal plane, like here and here. And then you can look at the, the mode distribution, mode profile in the waveguide. So you can tell that actually if this is fundamental mode or if this is a higher order mode. So basically, it's very simple, it's very straightforward. So you need the key component, which is the geometry, the source, the monitor, and the your and the, and the, and the kind of uh, uh, a rectangular that to to circle uh, to 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 to, uh, to uh, enclose your simulation zone. And there's one thing which is different from FEM that usually lumico mesh the entire structure in small cube. Yeah, and you know that actually. Uh, 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 for example, console actually mesh the thing with a, with a uh, triangle. So this is uh, actually a different. The reason that uh, why he actually mesh everything in the cube is just to make sure that the light propagates in the x, y, z direction with the same kind of speed. So if I take a time step, delta t, that he want to know that uh, make sure that the light move in the x direction, move in the y direction, or move in the z direction with the same step. And this is actually why actually the meshing is a bit different from the FEM method. Okay. <clears throat> then if you look at the rectangle, which is the bus waveguide, this part, then you can see the geometry. You actually can put the uh, X, Y, Z there. Yeah. And, uh, and then you can define the material. For example, uh, now I look at the, the cladding, which is this part. Yeah. And uh, I can actually select the, the cladding as a material as a SiO2. And uh, I'd have to override the mesh, because if you overlay two geometry together, you want to see, you want to make sure that which uh, geometry is on top of the other. So that's why the mesh order ties that the, uh, which one stand, uh, you will see, otherwise it will be overlap. You will cover the, the structure. You didn't see anything. So this is also very important that you need to make sure that everything uh, the, 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 mesh or the, the mesh order or the, the top, so uh, like, like, uh, like, uh, like a PPT, like a PowerPoint, or like a Adobe Illustrator, that they have to define, bring which one to the top. 
So this is a, this usually you have to do a sanity check. And you only see this uh, with this one, with the mesh order. If you don't check this one, then to the simulation software, it doesn't see the waveguide if, you, if the order is reversed. So this is the reason why a sanity check at the beginning to make sure that you do see the waveguide instead of let the waveguide be covered by the cladding. It's quite important. And, uh, and then you actually uh, put the, the ring. So this is the ring resonator. And then this is the geometry. So what we use is actually a typical value that we use for our uh, uh, microchrome uh, uh, project. So we have a kind of a ring with a diameter of uh, 23 micron, 23 point something. And uh, the height is something 0 0.75. Yeah, so this is a, a ring with uh, one terahertz uh, phase spectrum range. And of course, this now you have to put the, the material, the silicon nitride. So the material is the silicon nitride near EPFL and EPF, uh, uh, near IR and, uh, and the EPFL. So this is the silicon nitride that we measured with, uh, uh, so we measured the similar nitride reflect index that we measured here. And you can actually import, so if you don't trust the reflect index in the Lumico database, you can always import this. Uh, into the into the software, but actually I think you can get it uh, from components or somewhere. So you can check. Actually, you can you, this can be import imported. Uh, for sorry, from 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 the top. I th I remember there one one uh, material. Yes. So actually, you can import the any material. So if you find the the material you don't have, for example. Uh, People have silicon, silicon rich silicon nitride or silicon germania. That actually uh, the, the refractive index is, uh, is is not a very widely used, uh, or commonly uh, 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 adapted, and uh, and you can actually put the snail's laws of that particular material within the material uh, database. You create a new material, similar like our case here, that the silicon nitride refractive index is the one that we measured, the EPFL silicon nitride. Yeah. And then this is the bus waveguide. So of course you can make the same uh, same thing. And now you look at the FTTD region. So this is the FTTD region. Yeah. And uh, the geometry. So while you uh, make this F uh, enclose the simulation zone, uh, you have to be, uh, there's one thing that you have to consider is that the uh, uh, FDDD method is very time consuming. So you want to actually keep it only the core part. So you don't want to waste a lot of uh, space on irrelevant parts. So the optimized things that uh, you have to think about first is that I want to make the simulation zoom as small as possible. So that's why here you will find <coughs> that we put the light source at the boundary of the FDD zone. Because we, if we make it larger, Anyway, the the region behind the light light source is actually it doesn't give any concrete information, but actually it co co uh, consumes the simulation memory and also the space. So that's why we have to uh, um, use the uh, uh, every simulation region wisely and uh, economically. <coughs> yeah, and then you can push the put the mesh here. So the mesh, basic, the mesh accuracy, basically tells you that actually, if I mesh my structure into small mm -hmm. uh, volume, so into a small kind of uh, uni, uni cell, what is the size of the uni cell? So for the first simulation, so I suggest you to actually place this mesh accuracy to one, because mesh accuracy to one, basically, I think it's uh, the 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 math here is actually. The size of the cell is uh, the wavelength divided by the uh, mesh accuracy times two plus four, uh, times two, yeah, plus four. So if you have a mesh which is equal to one, then basically the mesh size, yeah, the size, to the, 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 the length of the unit cell is the wavelength divided by six. So if you have a, a 1550 nanometers uh, wavelength at the center wavelength, then mesh one basically tells you that the size of the unit cell is uh, something like uh, uh, 250 nanometers, something. Yeah, if you put, the, put it to, into, like, say, mesh three, then 
the unit cell is 150 nanometers. But uh, if you look at the volume, the number of unit cell, then basically it's a 2.5 divided by 1.5 cube. So actually the simulation zoom is actually, is, uh, it, the entire simulation uh, uh, it will, will, will cost uh, uh, four times, four times uh, resource. So that's why you don't want to start your simulation, the first trial, with high mesh accuracy. Because something goes wrong, you spend a lot of time there, you didn't get anything. And for all the rest of things that you, have to, you don't have to worry or uh, care about, basically just take the default values. And uh, this value is just where for very advanced users. And then there's also a trick that you can play with is the boundary condition. So I don't know if you guys, uh, this is taught in the, in the console? Yeah, in the console, yeah, okay. So, so just to re re repeat that actually here, we actually put here the, 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 the uh, blue zone because that uh, if we take a waveguide which has a rectangular uh, cross section and then basically this volume, the, the, the top half vo volume and the bottom half volume, they have the same geometry. So in principle, you just need to simulate half of the structure and uh, you can actually just uh, translate this data from the simulated part to the unsimulated part, you basically can get the entire data. So basically, you can, by playing with the boundary condition, yeah, you can actually save half of the uh, uh, resource for your simulation. Yeah. So symmetry is actually usually for the, for the electric polarization parallel to the boundary. And the anti-symmetry is actually for the uh, polarization normal to the boundary condition. Yeah. And, uh, and now you have to check about uh, what kind of uh, uh, PML condition you, you have. So there's a two, I think. One is uh, if, you, if you click this one, there's a stretch co coordinate the PML, right? And also there's, uh, there's the other one, it's called the standard uh, the PML. Uniaxial PML. Uniaxial, yeah. Let me have a look. Yes. So I probably suggest you first with the uniaxial PML because uh, you can actually switch uh, uh, switch both, and you'll find actually uh, uh, stretch the PML is actually larger. Let me have a look. So, so, so if I zoom in, oh. so it's like this, and then if I change boundary condition. Yeah, you see, you see the size are different. So, so it depends on actually what uh, application you are working with, and then you have to check with the which kind of uh, uh, boundary condition you use. So, just uh, give a kind of uh, uh, rule of thumbs is that the, uh, if you work with really broadband uh, structure, for example, sometimes we actually simulate uh, octave. Uh, frequency, like say uh, optical frequency from optical wavelength from one micron to two micron, usually you have to select uh, stretched uh, calling the PML. If you work with a narrow band source, like say I uh, work with a 1550 uh, nanometers wavelength and the uh, optical bandwidth is just uh, 10 nanometers or five nanometers, yeah, so it's a broad uh, optical pulse, and then usually you, you choose the uh, uniaxial, uh, 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 choose the, yes, choose the stretch, the coordinate PML. The reason is that the, uh, if you have a broadband source, yeah, uh, the one micron and the, and the, and the four mi uh, three micron, and actually different, different, they have different wavelength, they actually they propagate in a different way, because basically the, how much it propagate is it depend on the wavelength. So therefore, when you do the simulation with FDTD, you actually sometimes get an artifact, which is called a numerical dispersion, that due to the, the simulation, the step, the, you remember the year's algorithm, that actually different wavelengths, they actually with different step. So at a time, at a certain time, you will find actually one wavelength is, uh, is propagating slower compared with the other wavelength, but in reality, that's not the case. And this kind of uh, slow is, is uh, an artifact that are due to the mesh of your simulation. So that's why you have to use a stretch the coordinate uh, PML uh, to actually to uh, reduce this error. 
because this numerical uh, dispersion effect will accumulate usually at the boundary of your simulation. So that's why the stretched uh, coordinate PML is very thick. Yeah, it's usually thick. You usually put it something like 64 uh, layers or, or even more because it just uh, actually trying to reduce the numerical dispersion at the boundary. And this actually you can find out, uh, for example, if you look at the, the early papers on the PML, uh, perfect mesh layer PML boundary condition, and then you will realize that this is the case and you know actually how, why uh, you have to pay attention to this. So I would suggest that uh, we start with the boundary condition with the uniaxial anisotropic uh, PML and use the customer layer 12, okay? Like this, yeah. and uh, mm. okay, and then we look at the optical source. So the source, so of course, you. So first, you have to put the injection uh, axis and direction. This tells you where you actually inject the source. Okay. There's also another thing which is called the multi-frequency calculation, frequency point 30. This actually you don't have to, at this moment, it depends on what you're going to simulate. So let me have a look. So, so for example, if you look at the wavelengths, so if you go to the source to the wavelengths, and here what I simulate is actually from one micron to two micron, okay? And you know that if you have a different wavelengths, you calculate the fundamental optical mode, then different wavelengths should have a different mode profile. So how did you, how can you select the mode? Now what you select, uh, you select the mode, uh, for example, you actually use, uh, you press select mode, yeah? You select mode, and then basically the FTD actually works in the, the room will start working as a, as a finite element method like a console, yeah? And actually based on the cross section, based on where you place the optical source, you actually can calculate different mode. So, but, uh, but be careful that you also apply a boundary condition here. So that's why for all the mode, it's a TE polarization because you play the, yeah? So you can actually calculate the mode. And so when you calculate the mode, you'll find that actually you always work with a single frequency. So the mode is calculated with a single frequency. But if you want to work with a broadband source, and then you start to ask a question, so, so the, the simulation, the mode that I simulated at this particular frequency is a represent the mode in other frequency. So this actually, I can come to this point later. So um, yeah, so you have to put this, and, uh, and then there's a band waveguide. So you know that if you have a band waveguide, then actually your mode have to be pushed outwards to the band. So that's why you have to put the band radius here. For example, here it's uh, something like 24 micron and there's a band orientation. So the band orientation tells that whether the waveguide is bent in this plane, for example, in, in the X plane, so it's like, like this, or like this, or in the Y plane, it's so like this. So that's why there's four angles here. So here, that we just put 270 degree. And of course, if you reverse geometry, that sometimes you have to put 90 degree here. So, but this, you know that actually, if my bus waveguide is placed here, then I know that actually my ring, the, the coordinate of my ring resonance is here, then now actually the mode is pushed outwards. So I know 270 degree is the correct degree. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and then you calculate the mode and you select the mode. And then you basically know how it works. Yes. It depends on the bending. So basically, it depends on the, where the center of the ring is. Okay. So, so 270 is actually have the, the center of the ring here. 90 degree is actually have the center of the ring here. 180 degree, you will find that something weird happens. 180 and zero. Okay, and what happens if I put here 70? You can simulate, right? 
<laughs> you can, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's very weird, actually. If you, you, can, you can simulate. This actually costs just 10 seconds. We can simulate. Of course, why not? We just. There's a definition. Uh, yes, we can. Yeah. Oh, I put a zero. Okay. It's the same, yeah. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> comes where? Yeah, I think I think probably it's, uh, yes, probably it's here actually. All of the page, yeah. 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 So, so you don't have to know what you just know this is not the the, the model you're looking for, so, so, so that's why you have to have to put the two hundred. Yeah? yeah. So you know this is correct. Okay. Then you select this mode. Okay. Now you find actually once you select you start to calculate, and this calculation is the very is very special. The reason is that uh, remember that when we calculate this mode, we actually calculate the mode at a single frequency. But you also realize that actually when I launch the frequency wavelengths, actually I launch one micron to two micron broadband wavelengths. So this multi-frequency mode calculation is that I take 30 points frequencies from one micron to two micron, and I calculate the fundamental mode, the mode that we assigned at these 30 frequencies. So in the end, you propagate an optical pulse, but the mode distribution of different frequency is different from each other. So this gives you a very good precision. So if you calculate the mode profile based on, let's say, 1550, and this profile you use for one micron, and the mode will first diverge, and then you will not get the, the correct simulation. So this is actually a very unique function of Lumic, which they have to say they did a good job. And they only make this change, I think, as, a, uh, as 2018, uh, 2017, I think. 2017. So actually, uh, at the old time, that we suffer a lot to actually do this broadband simulation <coughs> because nobody really doing such a very, very broadband like our case. And of course, when you do this simulation, you, when you put a very broad uh, wavelength span, then you have to actually uh, check this, optimize for short pulse. And this actually makes the pulse become a bit more nature. All you can actually do this simulation for example, if you want, as you can just put the 1550, yeah, and you will find actually it's a still kind of a, a pulse shape with a certain bandwidth, but it's a much narrower. And then you can also use these things for kind of narrow band simulation. For example, let's say you can make it 1.5 to 1.6, yeah. Now, if you work with a narrow band source, then basically this multi-frequency calculation, sometimes you can disable. Because you can assume that actually, basically, since my optical bandwidth is uh, relatively small, the mode should more or less look the same. Yeah? OK. Now uh, the monitor. So, so usually I have, we, we, uh, my my habit is actually I put uh, uh, three monitors mainly. Usually, the first monitor is actually to cover the FTT zone. Basically, I want to see how the mode profile propagates from here to here. I want to have a general overview, and that's why I put the monitor in the plane. And this actually you can put to the Z normal. So Z normal is actually the monitor in the plane. And uh, oops. yes, <coughs> so for monitor, there's a, usually not much thing you have to do. Uh, you have uh, you need to change data to record, and the other thing you just take default. Yeah, and the second monitor is that I usually put the monitor here. Uh, this is just to uh, to investigate to make sure that actually the mode I choose is correct. 
So if I want to launch a fundamental mode from the source, here should be also the fundamental mode. So if the mode is OK, if I calculate the bending correct, yeah, and uh, launch with a uh, uh, normalized power of 1, here I should also get 1. So if I get something which is much lower than what I expect, or the mode profile is, is very weird, it means that I have some, said something wrong with my source. So that's why I usually put the uh, monitor uh, directly next to the source, just in to, to, to validate that the source that I put is correct. <coughs> and then, of course, you put the monitor here. Yeah, and you look at the, how much power is coupled inside, coupled to the to the to the waveguide. Yeah, and also uh, this is actually a material explorer. This I just mentioned to you that you can actually import the material property there, and actually you give few point and actually can fit the entire curve, and then you will get the real uh, real real part of your reflecting next and the imaginary parts. So this is some advanced functions. Then, of course, the, you can actually check your simulation. So this basically tells you actually how much uh, memory on the disk you, you require to complete this simulation. And then you can run. Yeah, and then you will find the, depending on mesh. So if you run with mesh one, and then you probably need one hour. So uh, uh, this is mesh three, I think. Yeah, you probably need the one hours. So just to show you actually how this uh, simulation looks like. So, so if I look at the M0, you see actually this is a very beautiful uh, kind of uh, uh, single mode. So basically, you see actually uh, the aspect ratio is a little bit distorted because I should actually stretch in this direction. <coughs> but you already can see actually basically the mode doesn't change its shape. So which means that the mode that I calculated here is correct. This is really the, the eigen mode of a bent wave guy. So you can also try to put the, uh, you calculate the mode, you put the bending angle 0 or 180 degree, and then you will see actually the mode bounce back and forth here, like a breathing mode. And this is actually due to the fact that the mode that you launch is not the, really the eigen mode. So it's a superposition of the fundamental mode and higher order mode. So these two modes start to be together. Yeah? And then if you can also look at the, uh, the mode uh, M1 here, yeah, you look at. So this is the fundamental mode, like uh, pretty much like uh, the the source mode we put. And you look at the mode here, then you see actually it has two lobes. So this is basically a fundamental mode with higher order mode. So you see actually the waveguide coupling here is not really ideal. That you put fundamental mode here, but you end up with the fundamental mode and higher order mode. So there's a multi-mode uh, participating in the, in the coupling. And this is, uh, if you look closely, you will find actually the reason is that due to the bending of the ring resonator, the refract index of the fundamental mode here is different from the refract in the index of the fundamental here. Therefore, the mismatch of the refract index actually couples the multi-mode together. So this is, uh, this is actually a, a typical problem that the, in the uh, integrated photonics, that you have to always optimize your structure such that the face matching condition is fulfilled, such that, that you have a, a literally single channel to single channel transmission in that instead of have multiple channels uh, coupled together. Yeah, and, uh, and another thing that we can try is that actually a, a pulley style coupler that uh, we are also doing, this is also related to our recent, very recent research, that actually we want to make octave spanning comb so we actually need to optimize. <coughs> so basically, you can look at uh, this paper, so which I think published on Optics Express recently. So you have to actually uh, look at the octave spanning spectrum. So we want to actually uh, uh, have a, have a, have a, the the uh, optimize the coupling efficiency for entire broadband. So you know that actually, if two wave guides are put together, the coupling is is basically induced by the evanescent field. So large Wavelength has a stronger evanescent and field, therefore they have a large mode overlap, so the coupling becomes strong. Uh, short wavelengths will become weaker. So ideally, uh, that the, you want to have a kind of structure which is broadband, which means that actually short wavelengths, long wavelengths, they have equally strong uh, refract index. So to do so, that actually you have to make a pulley structure, yeah, like this, and you can actually optimize 
the face mismatching and the mode overlap such that you can engineer the coupling envelope instead of have a kind of uh, uh, linear dependent. You can actually have a mode ma matching in induced uh, uh, coupling. And, but this is going to be a kind of complicated structure. So if you have time, you can, of course, uh, do this. Uh, I can also send you the model. Um, but this is going to uh, rely on uh, Lumerico uh, because uh, if you have a broadband structure, then you have to really uh, utilize the uh, bond, have to set the boundary condition very well, have to optimize your so uh, uh, light source, and then you can actually see the coupling with different wavelengths kind of as a function of the, uh, the coupling external, uh, uh, the coupling strength as a function of the wavelengths. Um, but the, this is going to be a little bit uh, complicated. So I would suggest that the probably first, if you have time, to work with the straight coupling. And then you can optimize, get uh, familiar with this software. And, uh, and there's uh, one assignment that actually, a paper that uh, I basically use Lumix to publish in, uh, last year. So you can have a look with this coupling ideality of uh, integrated planner of high tuning microresators. You probably just go directly to the last section of the simulation. So basically, I show you actually uh, the simulated uh, uh, structure that uh, is the one I gave to you. And then actually, I put a different FSR, so basically different radius, and different uh, height and, uh, and the recent width, with different gap, with different angle. And I look at that, how actually diff how different modes are coupled to each other, and make this kind of table. So you can actually uh, work with this one, and then you improve your software. And you can check if uh, you get the same value as, uh, as uh, what I published in the, in the paper. Maybe they have a different, slightly different, but uh, in principle should not be very, very different. So this is uh, what you can do with this uh, tutorial. Thank you very much.